it is often difficult to discern whether you are reading theology or philosophy. And at the beginning of St. Thomas's Summa Contra Gentiles, he asks whether any science other than theology is necessary. The answer is yes, philosophy is necessary too. But again in what follows, the line between theology and philosophy often blurs. St. Augustine gives a sustained account of the close relation of Christian theology to philosophy in his City of God. The pagan philosophical codifier, Marcus Terentius Varro, had distinguished three kinds of theology, mythical, physical, and political, or in Latin, that would be fabulous, natural, and civic. Varro observed that mythical or fabulous theology is that associated with the poets who tell and retell the often shocking tales of the Greco-Roman pantheon. Its natural home is the popular theater. Civic or political theology, on the other hand, is the theology appropriate to the city. It consists of the public rites and rituals which serve the interest of peace among the citizens. Physical or natural theology, finally, is the theology of the philosophers, which arose in the ancient world as a critique of the irrationality of mythic theology and which kept its distance from civic life. Because this natural theology undermines popular beliefs and the pagan theology which supports civic life, in fact, in many cases, it tends towards atheism, its natural home is to be secluded in the academy so as not to disturb the peace. Augustine then asks, in which category Christian theology might fall? And he is very clear. Christian theology is in continuity with physical or natural theology. Christian theologians are doing much the same thing that pagan philosophers had been doing. But they have a great advantage, which the pagan philosophers did not. For centuries, the pagan philosophers had strained every fiber of their reason to seek out the ultimate source and explanation for all things. In, in Christ, however, that ultimate source has sought us out. As a result, Christians need not secrete their theology in the academy, for the truth that has been found is not something hostile to human purposes, which had been, in one form or another, the unconsoling conclusion of the philosophers. Rather, the truth is life-giving, and is the, it is the source of a wholly new public order, a new city, the city of God. It is from these reflections that Christian civilization may be said to be born. Now, I've been discussing the nature of the Catholic Christian intellectual tradition as a response to the problem of the incarnation. The second reason why the incarnation lies at the heart of the tradition of Christian philosophical inquiry is a more positive one. In the Gospel of John, we read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and so on. John 1, verses 1 through 14, is in the traditional Catholic liturgy the last gospel read out by the priest at the conclusion of every Mass. What we learn in Scripture is that it is not God the Father who has become incarnate, but rather the second person of the Blessed Trinity, God's Logos, a Greek word which, as I'm sure you know, means both word and reason. At the very beginning, it is God's word or Logos that creates. Therefore, nature is not flux or chance or chaos, but rather possesses an order that is accessible to reason. To reason rightly about that which is, is to participate in the reason of God, at least analogically. To see the logos, the reason, within the created order is the vocation of man. Numerous of the church fathers, St. Basil, St. Augustine, and St. Ambrose, among many others, therefore wrote hexameral works Theological Treatises on the Six Days of Creation. Hexameron is six days. Such works explored the heights and depths of nature alone, rather than that which is above nature, driven by the confidence that the created order is a gift of the good and reasonable God. Because the Logos stands at the origin of all things, exploration into the sciences is connatural with Christianity. 
In the beginning, God's Logos creates. It is also God's Logos, incarnate, crucified, and risen, that redeems us after the fall. The natural and the supernatural have a single source, the Logos. It is this fact that ultimately lies behind St. Thomas Aquinas's axiom that grace does not destroy nature, but perfects it. Now, this is a large subject indeed. What is at stake is this. Should I pursue natural perfection or supernatural perfection? St. Thomas's answer, the Catholic answer, is yes. In other words, Catholic thought tends irresistibly towards a both-and style of thinking rather than an either-or style of thinking. It is naturally synthetic rather than analytic. Because the Logos is one, reason is one, there cannot be actual contradiction between natural and supernatural ends. One last comment on the Incarnation. Again, Jesus Christ is, so say all Christians, the Word made flesh. Here I cannot help but mention something that has long perplexed me and that perplexes many Catholics about many Protestant approaches to the intellectual life. Unlike Moses or Muhammad, Jesus wrote no book. For his contemporaries, the Word of God was the Hebrew Scriptures. But Jesus is himself the Word of God made flesh. To stand alone on the word of God must necessarily, therefore, be to stand alone on Christ, the everlasting man. And while Christ did not leave behind a book, he did, did leave behind a church with its sacraments that incarnate the divine gifts. Only years later did the apostles proceed to write down some of what they had experienced. And many decades later still, from among numerous Christian writings, did a council of bishops of the church authoritatively settle the canon of scripture. One thing Christians can certainly not say is in the beginning was the scripture. We are not Muslims. Suffice to say, for all these reasons, a Catholic approach to scripture differs markedly from the approach typically taken in Protestant Christianity. <laughs>